Well, good morning, Boulder Mountain Community Church. My name is Kyle, and I'm the pastor here. If we've not met, I would love to take a moment after service to say hello, answer any questions you might have about the church. There's an opportunity after, if you didn't, on your way in. There's a little tent out here. We can gather some information, not to show up at your door, but to just be available to let you know what's happening in the life of the church. Would you join me in prayer? And so, Father, as we open up your word, I ask that the Holy Spirit would move in a powerful way this morning. I pray we would hear from you. Nobody needs to hear from me today. We pray that we would hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We find ourselves in the middle of a series that we're walking through called With Us, a Christmas series, if you will, where we're not looking at the traditional text of Christmas the stories of Matthew and Mark and Luke. We talked about that a little bit last week. The Christmas cards that we all receive, they get fewer and fewer every year, but they tend to be one way or the other. One is a family photo, and the other is a photo of the manger scene, right? John takes a different approach. And a couple weeks ago, we looked at the mission statement that God gave his son Jesus in heaven before he comes to earth. Last week, we looked at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And today we're looking at 1 John chapter 1. If you have a Bible, you can grab it. We have some Bibles made available on your way in there by the door. You can grab one or you can pull it up on your device. The text will also be on the screen. 1 John chapter 1. And I set the context of what we're looking at today. The context is, number one, we have an old man. We have an old man, the writer of 1 John. He's some estimate 85 to 90 years of age, maybe the oldest writer of any book of the New Testament. It's the same writer of the Gospel of John that we looked at last week. John is an old man. You can tell that because he begins to refer to everyone else as children. You reach a certain age where everybody else is called children, regardless if they're family or not. And so first, second, and third John, he refers to people as my dear children as he's writing. So you begin with an, with an old man, uh, the author of John. You also have a very real problem that he is writing to address. John is writing to a group of people that have been, false teaching has sneaked into the church through the problem of Gnosticism. Gnosticism focuses on knowledge and believes that Body is bad. Matter is bad. And so Jesus, although he came, he did not come in physical form, was the teaching that John is writing a letter to address the problem of Gnosticism. A Gnostic would tell you that there were two footprints in the sand, and it wasn't Jesus' footprints, it was our footprints, if they were to interpret the footprints in the sand poem that we all have heard many times. A Gnostic would say Jesus was here in spirit, but not in physical bodily form. So that's the very real problem John is going to address. And then the third point, just to set the context, we have an old man addressing a very real problem. He's going to make a pivotal statement. This is found in the first four verses of 1 John. If you turn there, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, does that sound familiar? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, John goes back to the beginning. Jesus did not begin at Christmas. He did not have his start at Christmas. So very important, friends, to understand the pre-existence of Jesus. He has always been, and he will forever be. Jesus was from the beginning. And then he goes into... That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. John is an eyewitness testimony to the life and work and relationship with Jesus. I heard Jesus. I know what he sounds like. I know his voice. Some of us, when we get on the phone, we can tell immediately if it's that family member that we know thousands of miles away. We know their voice, right? We've heard their voice. We've spent years with them. We, we know who they are by the sound of their voice. You continue on, which we have seen with our own eyes. John says, I have seen Jesus. He's addressing the real problem 
of Gnosticism. Jesus was a real person. It didn't take very long for false teaching to begin to creep into the church. I saw him. I heard him. I didn't just see him. I observed him, which we looked upon and we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He was a real, physical, human being. That first night he was born into the world, I Mary held him in her arms, and maybe Joseph took a turn, and maybe the shepherds, when they arrived, maybe they passed the baby around, as you do in birthing centers. When family shows up, the baby gets passed around. Maybe the wise men got on their knees and played with the toddler, Jesus, when they showed up. It was a real human being. People touched Jesus. I think of the time where the kids were making a lot of noise, and the disciples told the children to be quiet, and he says, let them come to me. And he, they sat on his lap and he played with them, I imagine, right? I think of the time Jesus is sleeping in the boat and the disciples are scared and worried. The storm's brewing and how can he be sleeping? And there were, there's a number of different tactics to wake people up. As a dad of daughters, I've used all of them. Some of them work, some don't. I wonder if they went and had to shake Jesus, grabbed him by the shoulders. What are you doing? Why are you sleeping? They, John says, I touched him. John was one of the few at the cross. He saw, he looked upon the cross. He saw Jesus giving his life for you and for me. I saw him. I've heard from him. I looked upon him and I've touched him. Very real problem. He's addressing just the first verses. Jesus was a real human being who came to be with us. We looked upon him and have touched him with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it. We testify to it. John's testifying. I was there. I saw. I think of a time when I was in an elementary school and we went to visit Uncle Bill in Michigan. He lived in East Lansing, Michigan, and we're at his house and Bill says... Our Uncle Bill says, hey, we're going to go see the neighbors. And so he gathers all of us, and we go walk down to see our neighbors. And a woman answers the door, and Bill says, is your son home? And she says, yes, he's in the basement. Let me go get him. He goes and gets, she goes and gets her son, and Magic Johnson comes out. And we played basketball and shot hoops with Magic Johnson, my siblings. And there, I, we took a picture of it but we lost the picture. So I'm telling my friends, we go home, I played hoops with Magic Johnson. Yeah, right. Don't believe it, like you're doing right now. (laughs) I barely made the photo because he's 6'8", and I was knee high, and so they had to stand back. It was an old Polaroid photo. I can see it in my mind right now. But I'm telling you, I was there. I saw him. I witnessed him. He tried to guard me. We played basketball with Magic Johnson. This is the year between he was at home, the year he graduated from Michigan State before he was drafted by the Lakers. That's summer. You're questioning me right now. John is doing the same thing. I was there. I don't have a photo, but I was there. I spent my time with him. I I saw him. He was a real person in the flesh. I'm telling you. He's testifying to the fact. Our last series, I challenge you to write your testimony down if you haven't done so. You can still do so. Testify of your experience with Jesus and pass that on to your children and to your grandchildren and to share it. Share your testimony. Testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father that was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. How do you, how do you have fellowship with Jesus? It's, he talks about it here. It's with, it's with other people. John's writing so that you might have fellowship with us. As we have fellowship with the Father, you too can have fellowship with the Father fellowship with others. It's called koinonia. It's a Greek word. It's what's happening here this morning. It's what's happening outside on the patio as you come in after and before service. 
It's what happens during the week when we gather for Bible studies in small groups and, and we spent hundreds of hours working together to put on live nativity. That is fellowship, koinonia. As we have fellowship with the Father, it allows us to have fellowship with, with each other. And John is testifying and proclaiming this fact. And verse 4, where we're going this morning. And we are writing these things. Why? So that our joy may be complete. My friends, is your joy complete this morning? Do you have joy? If so, some of us need to tell our face that we have joy. <laughs> there are times people look upon me and think, you're not a very joyful looking person. And I need to remind my face of the joy that I have. If you haven't noticed, our world is not full of joy. In fact, most interactions and most people I talk to and interact with and have conversations with, there's, there's sorrow and there's sadness and there's grief and there's brokenness. And yet I go back to Matthew 2.10, which says, good news of great joy for all people. That's what the coming Messiah, that's what was brought to earth. Good news of great joy for all people. So I asked myself, what's happened? Where'd the joy go? Where's the gap from good news of great joy for all people to there's not much joy in our world today? When I go to the dog park, I'm like the bartender where everybody shares with me their deepest and darkest secrets and problems. I don't know why that is. If you have a dog, you have something in common, and you can share, you just share everything with them. And so a couple days ago, I'm at the dog park. It's before the sun arise is, is, has risen, and people are sharing with me the hurt and the pain and the brokenness. And a man shares with me he hasn't seen his three sons in 20 years. And they're, everywhere you look, there's hurt and brokenness and sadness and broken relationships. And I think... But I thought Jesus came to bring good news of great joy for all people. So where's the gap? John is writing so that our joy might be what? Complete. So go on a journey with me as we discover what it looks like to have real joy. Number one, it begins through the work and person of Jesus Christ. You and I will never find full and complete joy apart from Jesus. He is the only one who will give you full joy and complete joy. You can look everywhere else. I've been reading about the life of Matthew Perry who played Chandler on the sitcom Friends for so many years. When he was 19 years of age, he was a young actor in Hollywood and he said, God, he got on his knees and said, God, you can do anything with me as long as you make me famous. And it's a sad testimony of his whole life. He passed away recently. They just came out with his cause of death here recently. He was 54 years of age. In his 54 years of age, he spent 35 years in recovery. But he never found sobriety. He spent $7 million on recovery, trying to beat the addictions that he had succumbed to. He went through detox 68 times in his life. He had many near-death experiences where he had to be revived. And he says, as he's writing his book, he says, I wish I never became famous. He found, he looked for peace. He looked for joy in every which way. And he was making a million dollars an episode. And he never, I don't know if he ever found true joy. But there are many people like Matthew Perry in our neighborhood, in our culture, in our society. Everywhere you look, they're running to find things that will find, they think will give them joy and fulfillment. How do you and I find joy? It begins with the person and the work of Jesus. If you've not met Jesus personally, today can be that day. I would love to have a conversation with you after service where you place your faith and trust in Jesus, the creator of the world who left his throne in heaven to come to be with you and with us. Number two, we find joy through fellowship with other people. At the end of the day, the only things that matter at the very end of our life are two things, our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. 
I've been alongside the bedsides of many people who are taking their last breath. The only two things that matter are your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. There is nothing else at that moment that matters. Fellowship with other people. It is not too late to reconcile with broken relationships, with sons and daughters and with moms and dads and with grandparents and with siblings. Now is the time. Now is always the right time to move toward reconciliation. How do you find complete joy through the person of Jesus, number one? Number two, you find complete joy through fellowship. Naturally, we want to stay isolated. It's easier to stay at home. It's easier to not show up. The third, the third way we find joy is through our circumstances. Now, there's two types of circumstances. There's news of today, and then there's final news that we all experience as followers of Jesus. Let me explain this to you. Imagine you're in a circle. What a circumstance means? It means to stand upon. We're all standing upon certain circumstances as we gather this morning together. There's, you could be standing upon some circumstances that you woke up this morning, you had a great night of sleep. It's good. You slept really well. You just received word that you're getting a promotion at work. You're drinking your best cup of coffee you've ever had in your entire life. And you found out your son made the dean's list. It's all news and facts that you're experiencing in the moment. And you recognize my circumstance. There's happiness there and there's joy there. Happiness and joy. It's good, right? Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not a follower of Jesus, that's good news. You can experience that. The Bible tells us this too shall pass. As good as that is, there'll be a day where you'll wake up and your allergies kept you up all night. Your coffee was cold. You just got fired and your daughter dropped out of school, right? <laughs> Circumstances. We rise and fall with emotions based upon whether we're happy or we're unhappy. And let me tell you, friends, don't base your life on the feelings and the emotions of today. Those facts and will come and go. You will experience things, emotions, highs and lows today. And as a follower of Jesus, our joy is not found ultimately in that. They're good things. And I would say enjoy good things. Every good and perfect thing that you and I experience has been bought through the person of Jesus on the cross. It's grace. Grace falls upon the good, the righteous, and grace falls upon the unrighteous. Whether you're a follower of Jesus, there are good things in life for everyone. Common grace, it's called. At the same time, followers of Jesus and people who are not followers of Jesus experience sorrow and sadness and grief. As I follow Jesus, I do not allow the emotions to drive the bus of my life. They can be on the bus. They can have a seat on the bus in the back of the bus. But I let my truth, convictions of what I know to be true, that do not change. I let those things drive the bus. And what are those things? Imagine, if you will, outside that circumference of the facts that rise and fall every day is another circle. And it's the final news. It's the great news that never changes. What are, what are those facts? The facts of the immutability of God, meaning God never changes. We change 100 times a day. God never changes. You can trust him. The facts of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, that he has paid for all of our sins for all time. Regardless how your, bad your day is today or tomorrow morning when you wake up, that will not change. That gives us hope. The triumphant resurrection of Christ does not change. Justification by faith, meaning you are made right through Jesus. That does not change based upon how good or bad your day was. That's final news. That's good news of great joy for all people. Those are the facts and the truth of God's word that's standing in a circle all around us. My joy is, is found dependent upon those ultimate circumstances. My joy is complete upon those. 
On the last day, the ultimate circumstances will swallow up the immediate circumstances. And every tear, my friend, will be wiped away. Until then, by God's grace, I'll pursue joy by changing every circumstance. So some of our circumstances can be changed. With biblical wisdom, change what you can change in your life. If it's, you're getting poor results, change them. But most circumstances, I have found, are outside of my control. Change what you can change, accept what you cannot. In any sad circumstance, I'm unable to change as the providence of the all-wise God. And I'll remember wise advice, that weeping may tarry for the night, but my friend's joy may come in the morning. Years ago, I had some great pastoral advice that said, and this is just good general advice, wherever you find yourself in life, as you're going through a dark season, a difficult season, joy, it will look better in the morning. It will look better in the morning. If you're taking notes, you can just write that down. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes just a good night of sleep, a different perspective, looking at something differently, it'll be better in the morning. That first night when Jesus entered the world, I don't think it was a silent night. It's a great song. I think the circumstances of that night were difficult and hard. It was dark. Would somebody turn the light on? There's animals. Who let that animal in here? Would somebody stop the baby from crying? Imagine. I don't think it was peaceful. I think it was a hard situation. It was a difficult situation. Maybe it looked better in the morning. For some of us, it needs to look better. We hold out hope that it will look better in the morning. Hope precedes joy oftentimes. Jesus talked a lot about joy. When he's talking to his father in the high priestly prayer, this is, this is what he writes. This is what Jesus says to his fathers. Oftentimes, we think of the Lord's Prayer as the prayer that he teaches the disciples, but this is really more the Lord's Prayer. We get an eavesdrop in Jesus talking to his father, and he says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus' prayer for you and I today is that our joy would be made complete. He longs for you to experience joy. It doesn't mean life isn't going to be difficult at times. But in the difficult, in the hard, in the storm, you can experience true joy. Jesus says, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Do you experience fullness of joy today? These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Spurgeon says, if any of us have lost the joy of the Lord, Lord, I pray that you do not think it is a small loss. If we've lost the joy that one day we had and we, were remind, we think of and we made a decision to give our life to Jesus and it was a f- decision full of joy, some of us in the room, we've lost that. And we rise and fall based on the decisions of each and every day. In Hebrews 12, 2, I'll invite you to listen to this verse. Hebrews chapter 12, it's right after the Hall of Fame chapter of faith. Jesus writes, Jesus, the author writes, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, for the what set before him? For the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning the shame, And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' desire was joy. He longed and looked forward to the day where he would stand before his father and be glorified. Mission accomplished. That's what he's looking forward to before he goes to the cross. How is that accomplished? How does he experience the fullness of joy? Do you know what the joy was that was set before him? You and I. 
who for the joy that was set before him, before he goes to the cross, Jesus is thinking of joy. He says to his father, and he prays to his father if there's any other way, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus was able to endure the ordeal of the cross because he understood the good that would come out of it, the good of a redeemed, rescued people honoring God for all eternity. Knowing all the good that would flow from the most agonizing experience, Jesus was able to do it and to endure it with triumph. Through the ordeal of the cross, Jesus kept his tongue. He kept his course. He kept his progress. He kept his love for you. And he kept his joy. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's good news of great joy, my friends, for all people. There's no one excluded from that on this planet. Jesus came so you might have, you and I might be able to have a relationship with him. Back in the mid-1800s, there was a gentleman who lived in the city of Chicago. He was a wealthy businessman. He had a lot of real estate. He had five children. He was an elder of a Presbyterian church when the great Chicago fire happened. He lost all of his wealth. All of his real estate was burned to the ground. His son passed away at a young age, the age of two. He lost his son. He had four daughters. He sent his four daughters and his wife on a ship to go to London for a vacation. He said, I will meet you there. You go on ahead, and I'll catch the next ship, and I'll meet you there. That ship went down, and his wife was the lone survivor. He received a telegram in in Chicago that said, I, the ship went down, our daughters, all four daughters were lost, and I alone survived. He hops on the next ship to head to London, and he tells the captain, hey, when we get to the point of where the ship went down that my wife was on, would you, would you let me know? It's in the middle of the night, and the captain leaves, and he comes down, and he wakes Horatio up, and he says, hey, we're about the proximity of where the ship went down. He grabs pen, and he grabs paper, and he walks out on the balcony of the ship, and he begins to write these words, the words of the song, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford did not find joy in his circumstance. He found his joy in the final news, not today's news. The final news of though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. That's good news of great joy for all people. It is well. It is well with my soul. He was able to write that while in the midst of great grief, grieving the loss of his four daughters who drowned, the loss of his business, the loss of his son, if you're looking for joy to come from your present circumstance, I want to let you know you'll never find it. But there's bigger news and there's greater news, news that will never change, final news. And that is, by placing your faith and trust in Jesus, he declares you good and right, and that will never change. As good as your days are and as bad as your days are, this too will pass but who Jesus declares you to be will never change. If you've not placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I would love to have that conversation with you today. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Jesus longs for each and every one of us to experience joy this Christmas season. Not just this Christmas season, but every day for the rest of our life. Number one, if you've lost joy, would you spend some time this season sitting in silence, letting the truth of God's word fill you, letting you be reminded of how much God loves you? For those of us as followers of Jesus who've crossed that line of faith, let's look like we're people of joy. Let's live like there's something to live for and something to be joyful about. Amen. 
as we interact with people. You're going to interact with people who are broken and hurting and grieving all around us as we go throughout this week. And this is supposed to be the most joyful time of the year, right? Would you sit a little longer with them? Would you ask them questions? Would you put yourself out there, pray for them? Hug them? Put your arm on them? Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He showed up. When you show up for someone, it's different than a text. It's different than sending an email. It's different than leaving a voicemail. Who in your life do you need to show up for? To show up. That's what Jesus did for us. He is with you today. Follower of Jesus, there's nowhere you can go apart from his presence today. He is with you. That is good news of great joy for all people. Would you pray with me? So, Father, as we come to this time in the service, I ask that you would move and you would speak to each one of us. We're all at different places this morning. For some of us, we need to be reminded of how much you love us and that you left your throne in heaven so that you might be able to have a relationship with us. We're not deserving of that. But this morning, we declare we are grateful. For those of us who've not crossed, who've not said yes to Jesus, who've not placed our faith and trust in Jesus, may today be the day. May we enter this Christmas season with a whole new understanding of what that looks like. Would you move and work, Holy Spirit, in the next few moments? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.